Hi, boys and girls, it's Miss Crawford back with you for more third grade social studies and teaching in room nine. We have so much to cover today because we finished our field trip at the Lewis and Clark Boathouse with a special guest who is going to tell us all about the journey of Lewis and Clark and the core of discovery. But before we start, let's go ahead and do our land acknowledgement statement. We would like to acknowledge the ancestral territory of the Mississippian mound builders and the Osage. It is important to recognize not only their land, but also their elders of the past, present, and future. They were unfairly removed from the land we live on today. Oh, we live on now. We will continue to learn about Native people and other cultures. Alrighty, so did you get a chance to write your journal entry? Man, I wish we had time to do one together. What were you excited about as a member of the core? Oh, you were just excited about the journey. I know I would be too. I would also be excited about the boats. Which one would you want to be on? The keel boat, the pirogue, red one that was long, or the white one that was shorter? You would want to be on the pirogue? Yeah, they are kind of cool looking boats. I think because I would also be a little nervous, I would want to be on the keel boat, something a little bit bigger. Yeah. So remember last week, we had some words that we needed to know. And we had core, which is a group, a part of the military and assigned a particular work. Expedition was the journey for a purpose. Cartographer, you remember that? A person who makes maps. Journal, it's a written record that is daily and detailed. And that's what Lewis and Clark needed to do for President Thomas Jefferson. And replica, a model of a, in our case, a boat, right? So we've got some more words that we need to know going into this week that we're going to hear. So the first two are tribes. And the first one is the Mandan tribe and they were in North Dakota. So let's look at that on our map. I circled it for us already. So here is St. Charles, where we, Lewis and Clark started, and the Mandan tribe is there, okay? The next one is Shoshone. Can you say Shoshone? Yeah, that E is not silent like in our language. They actually pronounce it with a long E. And it's the tribe of Sacagawea. And they were in Idaho and Wyoming. Okay, so let's take a look at where that is on the map. They were right here in the Rocky Mountains and they would travel into Wyoming and Idaho. Okay, the next word is not a tribe, it's the word toll. Do you know what a toll is? You've heard of it, like you pay a toll when you're traveling sometimes, right? Well, it's the same idea. It's when you have to pay to cross a road or a bridge. And so for Lewis and Clark, of course, no roads, no bridges, but some of the native tribes required them to pay a toll in order to pass the Missouri River or the Columbia River by their tribe, by their villages, okay? And the last one, Fort Clapsa. Fort Clapsa is actually where Lewis and Clark came and set up camp and they named it after one of the tribes in the Oregon country where they ended at the mouth of the Columbia River. So let's take a look at that on the map. That would be right here. And you see, it's right at the Pacific Ocean. So did they find that waterway? Well, today we are going to be finding out. We're going to start and as we are listening to our guest, and I will let him introduce himself, I want you to be listening for the challenges that Lewis and Clark and the Core Discovery faced. And I want you to be listening for the triumphs, the things that went very well for them. Okay, so let's get started. Hello, I'm, my name is Bill Brecht. I'm uh, 
volunteer at the Lewis and Clark Boathouse and Museum in St. Charles, Missouri. And we're here to talk about Lewis and Clark and their journey. Now, if we uh, start um, kind of at the beginning of their journey in this area, uh, they had spent the winter of 1803 and 1804 in, on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. Uh, when they arrived in December of 1803, uh, the land we're on right here in St. Charles was still French territory. And so they couldn't set up a U.S. Army camp on French land, so they had to do it on American land, which was the, uh, on the Illinois side of the river. So they spent uh, the winter in a small camp. They had built uh, several small log cabins connected by walls, uh, spent five months there. Uh, by the spring of 1804, then, uh, the French had turned this land over to the U.S. as part of the Louisiana Purchase. And then Lewis and Clark and their men could cross the Mississippi River and start heading up the Missouri. They decided that uh, in May of 1804, uh, Clark would bring the three boats that they had and the 40 men uh, as far as St. Charles and stop. Lewis had to go into St. Louis to finish up some business, so he told Clark, go to St. Charles, stop and wait, and I'll catch up to you there. So they come to St. Charles, and uh, Clark and, and the, the rest of the men uh, bring the boats, and then they set up a small temporary camp in St. Charles. Uh, at the time, they recruited then two more men to go with them here in St. Charles. And they also spent some time with the local people that lived here. Uh, they went to a couple of dances that the people put on for them. They uh, were treated to uh, special dinners and, and that kind of thing. They were quite the celebrities back at that time. Uh, Lewis, uh, well, Clark and the men arrived here on May 16th of 1804. And then Lewis arrived on May 20th. And so once Lewis got here, everybody was finally here, all in the same place, and they were ready to go. They had gotten more supplies while they were here in town, and they were really prepared. When Lewis got here then, uh, the next day, May 21st, they took off from St. Charles about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and went about three miles upriver, and then stopped for the night. They only went about three miles that first day, with several thousand miles to go ahead of them. And so they stopped and, and the idea was they were for the first time out where there was no towns ahead of them. And if they forgot something, something they didn't have, they weren't so far away from St. Charles, they couldn't go back and get it. And they did send a couple of men back to get a few things. Well, they go up the river from St. Charles. Uh, there's one of the things that Ms. Uh, President Jefferson had told them was to make contact with all the Native Americans along the way and make friends with them. Because Jefferson thought it's important that we be able to trade with all the Native Americans, uh, to buy and sell things with them, uh, and also to make it easier for other people to follow up the river uh, if everybody's friendly. Well, they didn't meet any Native Americans until uh, about three months uh, after they left St. Charles. And uh, the meetings with the Native Americans were friendly most of the time. Well, as they move up, they come across the big buffalo herds and the Native Americans that do hunt the buffalo. Um, a little more than three months after they left St. Charles, one of the men uh, in the party did pass away. Uh, Sergeant Charles Floyd uh, had what uh, doctors today think was appendicitis. And back then, they had no way to treat that. And he does uh, die from that. He is the only man to die during the entire expedition, which is really quite remarkable for the time. Uh, so they had a funeral service for him. Uh, he was buried uh, on a bluff above the river. Uh, his grave is still there today. And there's a monument over it and so on. Hey, guys, did you hear that huge challenge that the Corps faced just three months or so into their journey? Yeah, they had one of the Corps members die. All right, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so we can start keeping track on the challenges and triumphs. Let's make that the first one. 
a core. Make that a capital A member. Died. Wow, that was pretty sad. But can we pull a triumph out of that? Yeah, Mr. Breck said that it, he was the only member of the Corps to die on the whole trip there and back. That is a triumph because remember, how many dosage of medicines did they have? Do you remember that from last week? 6,000 dosages. They thought it would be a lot more illnesses. Only one core member only one core member died the whole trip. Okay. I wonder if you caught the other challenge that I heard. Did you guess what Mr. Breck said? That they started and only went three miles because they didn't have access to what once they got going on their journey? Supplies. That's the God, that has to be a real challenge, right? So no access to purchase supplies Wow it's not like nowadays you can't just stop at the gas station along your trip right okay so let's keep listening to mr. Brett as they continue moving up the river uh, they eventually meet with the uh, Sioux Native Americans and they do have a little bit of trouble there the Sioux didn't want them to pass uh, on the river uh, without paying kind of a, a, a toll. And so there's a bit of a confrontation there. There is not an actual fight. Uh, cooler heads prevail, and they are able to uh, pass on by the Sioux. As they continue up the river in 1804, by November they get to where the Mandan Indians live. And that's in about where the middle of the state of North Dakota is today. And so uh, they decide to stop and spend the winter. It's November, they're up pretty far north, and it's getting cold. And they know they won't be able to travel on the river when it's covered with ice. So they set up a camp <coughs> near the Mandans. The Mandans were very friendly. Uh, there was a lot of them. They had large villages. There was almost 4,000 people living there. That's bigger than St. Louis was back then. And the Mandans lived in uh, not teepees like the Sioux, but they did live in uh, uh, lodges that uh, were made out of earth, basically. Uh, they had a wood frame on the inside, then they covered that with sod, dirt and grass on the outside. And so they lived in these round uh, lodges. The biggest of them was about 50 feet across, so some were pretty good size. And uh, they were a, a good place to live during the cold winter because they were pretty well insulated, they could build a fire in there, keep it fairly warm, and so on. And so uh, the uh, soldiers then, that were with Lewis and Clark, they didn't live in the Indian village, but across the river from the village, they built another uh, fort uh, type of camp, and that's where the soldiers lived for the next several very cold months. Uh, Clark kept track of the temperature every day and every night while they were there. Uh, one morning when he got up, he measured the temperature at 45 degrees below zero. And so it's very cold. Uh, cold enough, actually, that the Native Americans, the Mandans, uh, took their horses inside their houses overnight. And they would live in there because it was too cold even for the horses to be outside. So it is a very cold winter, but living with the Mandans, they're able to hunt buffalo with them, uh, and they had a large storage of uh, grain and so on, so they were able to survive the winter that way. Oh, wow. There goes one of our vocabulary words, toll. Did you hear what Mr. Breck said about tolls? 
Yeah. The Sioux Indians, the Sioux tribe, demanded a toll in order for the Corps to cross the Missouri River by them. So the Sioux Nation demanded a toll that could have been something dangerous for them. But what's the triumph out of it? Yeah, they were able to compromise and work out a deal. They were able to compromise. We're going to talk a little bit more about that word in a lesson coming up. But it's like coming to an agreement. Did you hear any more challenges or triumphs? Yeah, winter was really cold. They were staying with what tribe? Yeah, they were staying with the Mandan in North Dakota. Do you remember how cold it got? Negative 45 degrees, right? Definitely have to add that to our challenges. Winter in North Dakota was, and we have to put the minus first, negative or minus 45 degrees. Is there a triumph we can pull from that? How did they survive? Yes, the Mandan tribe taught them how to survive. Do you think that was something that they're going to use later on on the rest of their journey? Definitely. So they were able to build the relationship with the Mandan, like President Jefferson wanted them to do, and learn survival. What's an adjective we could use to describe that kind of winter? Yeah, the freezing winter, the cold. <laughs> I hear dangerous too. Yeah, all those words would work. I think I'm going to go with maybe harsh, right? Okay, we'll listen for more challenges and triumphs. Well, finally spring comes and the ice begins to melt on the river. Lewis and Clark are ready to go again. And they sent the biggest boat, the keel boat, back to St. Louis. Uh, it was too big to go any farther up the river. But the two smaller boats, uh, the two Perros, uh, they did continue up the river with them. Uh, and they uh, made it eventually to the Great Falls. Uh, there is a, a, there was at the time, a set of waterfalls on the Missouri River, and so they took the boats that far. Uh, they couldn't get the boats, of course, up the falls, and they were too big to take them out of the river and move them around the falls. They did have six uh, Native American canoes by that time, and so they did take the canoes out of the river, moved them 18 miles uphill to get them around the falls and then continued on from there. And it took them about three weeks to do that. The Native Americans had told them, when you come to the falls and you take everything out, we get it done in about half a day. And so <laughs> when it took them three weeks, it was kind of disappointing. But they did get the job done. And once they get around the falls, <clears throat> they uh, uh, again continue up the river some more and they're looking for the Shoshone Native Americans. Now, the, the reason they want to find the Shoshones is because they find out they're going to have to have horses to get across the mountains. And Lewis and Clark didn't have any horses with them at the time, but the uh, natives that they had stayed with during the winter said, well, find the Shoshones when you get to the mountains and get horses from them. They have nice horses. Well, uh, by this time, they also had the Native American girl, Sacagawea, with them. They had met her and her French husband during the winter when they were with the Mandans. 
And so they uh, have them come along. Uh, her French husband, a man by the name of Charbonneau, says, if you pay me, I'll translate the Indian languages for you. And they thought, well, that's good. And then they found out that his uh, wife was, uh, Sakagawea was actually a Shoshone. And when they find that out, they want her to go too because they were told, well, you have to get horses from the Shoshone. So they think maybe she can help us get those horses. So uh, they do find the Shoshones. It takes uh, a while to do it. But by this time, Sakagawea began to recognize where they were because this is the land where she used to live. She recognizes where she is. She tells them, follow this one river up the, uh, into the mountains and you should find the Shoshones. I remember being here as a young girl. Well, they do find the Shoshones and right away Lewis and Clark try to buy horses. But they run into a problem and that's language. Uh, Sacagawea does speak Shoshone, of course, but she doesn't speak English. Uh, she speaks Shoshone and Hidatsa, which is the language of the people she was living with. Well, what they do, Lewis asks, asks a question of the Shoshone chief uh, in English. And then a Frenchman with him, with uh, Lewis, who actually joined him here in St. Charles, would translate from English into French. And then Charbonneau, Sacagawea's French husband, would translate from French into Hidatsa. <laughs> and then Sacagawea would translate from Hidatsa into Shoshone. Oh, wow. So every time there's a question and answer, there's four languages to go through. And, and that's hard to do. If you've ever played the game telephone, <laughs> where everybody's speaking the same language, yeah. imagine how the message gets messed up. We'll try that again and use four different languages. <laughs> right. See what happens. But, they are able to successfully buy 29 horses. Okay, let's stop there and get some more challenges and triumphs. I know he knows so much and he does such a great job of telling us. So let's do this quickly and get back to it. What was the problem with the Great Falls? Yeah, trying to get over them, right? How long did it take them to get over the Great Falls? Three weeks. Let's put that as a challenge. Yeah. How long did, did the man didn't tell them it took them? One day. Boy. Okay, so after getting over the Great Falls, they realized they needed to also get over what? The mountains. What was the challenge with that? Yeah, they couldn't take the pirogues. They couldn't take the keel boat. It needed to go back. And they had to get their supplies over. Yeah, challenge there. Who helped them again? And they told them to talk to who? Yes, the Mandans told them to get it from the Shoshones. So here we go. The Mandans are a great big help with survival out there. So the Mandans told them to get horses from the Shoshone. Now, what was the problem once they got to the Shoshone? What was the challenge? Communication. How were they going to talk to the Shoshones to get horses? Sacagawea. Very good. So let's put communicating with the Shoshones. But the triumph was Sacagawea could translate for them. And how many horses did they get? They got 29 horses. Okay, I won't stop us to the end now. And so they start making the mountain crossing. They're not riding the horses across the mountains. They're using them as pack animals. The horses are carrying all their stuff. And so they uh, start crossing the mountains. It was supposed to take one day to cross the mountains, but it takes them 11 days. Uh, they get lost is what happens. Uh, it's in September, it's snowing in the high mountains. And so they, uh, the snow keeps covering up the trail and they lose their way several times. So like I say, it takes 11 days to get across the mountains. 
Uh, by this time, they are running out of food. And so they do end up killing and eating three of the horses to help, help them get across the mountains. But they do make it across, and on the other side of the mountains, they meet the friendly Nez Perce Indians, who then uh, help them build new canoes. Because now they're on the west side of the mountains, the rivers finally go downhill towards the Pacific Ocean, and they uh, <coughs> uh, need canoes, because they had to leave all their boats and canoes on the east side of the mountains. Nez Perce help them build new canoes, and they start heading down the western rivers. Are uh, they still on the Missouri River? No, they have left the Missouri by this time. Okay. Uh, when they, uh, uh, at the point where they had gotten the horses, they had already left the Missouri River. Because okay. yeah, it only goes so far into the mountains. So what river were, did they end up on, crossing uh, the mountains? Well, when they got across the mountains, they uh, first of all went down the Clearwater River, which goes into the Snake River, and that goes into the Columbia River. And then the Columbia okay. goes all the way to the coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They do uh, get all the way to the coast, and they meet uh, the several Indian tribes there, and they spend uh, the next winter uh, all along the west coast. It's November when they get to the coast, and so they build another camp uh, that's in, they call Fort Clatsop, Name for uh, Native Americans living there. It is wet. They were there for more than a hundred days, and it rains every day but 12. I have a timeline here to leave St. Charles and get all the way to the coast. Took them a year and a half. Okay. Um, How many miles did they travel? Well, it turns out from with the route they took from here in St. Charles to the Pacific Ocean was 4,000 miles. Total of 8,000 miles wow. from St. Charles to the ocean and back again. Well, we want to thank Mr. Breck again for sharing all of his knowledge with us about Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery and the members and their travel and their expedition. And so that is our afternoon. I can't wait to hear your journal entries next week. Take care. Bye guys. in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.